Good morning, everyone. Today's date is October 6, 2022. My name is Derek Bonner. I'm a member of the AD support team for today's proceedings, and I'd like to formally welcome you to the 177th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. At this time, I'd like to hand the meeting over to our chair, Dr. Hannah al -Sally. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I welcome the members, uh, the participants, and the public to the 177th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. The topic today will be strain selection for the influenza virus vaccine 2023 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. We will begin our meeting today with some administrative announcement, roll call, and conflict of interest statement by the designated federal officer of the meeting, Dr. Susan Haydar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. El Sali. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Susan Paidar, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer, DFO, for today's 177th Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation Research, uh, CBER, and the committee, I'm happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to discuss the strain selection for the influenza virus vaccines for the 2023 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. Today's meeting and the topic are announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on August 18, 2022. At this time, I would like to introduce and acknowledge outstanding leadership of my division director, Dr. Prabha Kara Treya and the excellent work of my team whose contributions have been critical for preparing today's meeting. Christina Vert is my backup DFO and will be supporting me throughout the meeting today. In addition to Christina, other staff who contributed significantly and provided excellent administrative support are Ms. Karen Thomas, Ms. Joanne Lipkine, and Ms. LaShawn Marks. I also would like to express our sincere appreciation to Mr. Derek Bonner in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FDA staff working very hard behind the scenes, trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one, like all the previous VRPAC meetings. Please direct any press media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at FDAOMA at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptionist for today's meeting is Ms. Linda Giles. We will begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and a temporary non-voting member. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera, unmute your phone, and then state your name and last name. And when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please um, see the member roster slides in which we'll begin with the chair, Dr. Hannah el -Sahim. Hannah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Hannah Sahli, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I am uh, an adult, adult infectious disease, uh, diseases physician, and my research focuses on clinical vaccine development. Thank you. Dr. Haley altman gantz Good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, my name is um, Dr. Gans and Haley Gans, and I'm pediatric infectious disease at Stanford. Um, my research focuses on um, the immunology, the host pathogen interface, and uh, with a particular interest in vaccine responses. Thank you. Great, thank you. Dr. Paula Anunziato, non-voting member, our industry representative. Paula? Good morning, everybody. Waiting for my video to come up. Good. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paula Annunciato. I am uh, the head of vaccine clinical research at Merck, and I am today's non voting industry representative. Great. Thank you, Paula. Dr. Adam Berger. Just waiting for the video to pop in. Yes. 
Scott. Hi, Adam Berger. I'm the uh, director of the Division of Clinical and Healthcare Research Policy here at NIH. Great, thank you. Dr. Henry Bernstein, Hank. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of uh, Medicine at Hofstra and Northwell. I'm a general pediatrician with expertise in vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Archana Chatterjee. I'm not sure. Ah, here's my video. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I have the privilege to serve as Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science in North Chicago. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist with a focus in the field of vaccines. Thank you, Archana. Captain Amanda Cohn. Good morning, everyone. I am um, uh, Amanda Cohn. I'm a pediatrician at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with expertise in vaccine preventable diseases and public health. Thank you, Amanda. Dr. Holly James. Good morning. I'm Holly James. I am a professor at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle, um, a biostatistician by training, and my uh, specialty is vaccine evaluation. Great. Dr. Arnold Monta. Good morning. I'm Arnold Monto. I'm at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where I've uh, worked on epidemiology and prevention, mainly of respiratory infections, particularly influenza. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Paul Offit. Yeah, um, good morning. I'm Paul Affitt. Uh, I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. My interest is in vaccines, specifically mucosal vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stephen Pergam. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Pergam. I'm a professor in the Division of Vaccine and Infectious Diseases at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And my particular focus is on infections and immunocompromised Great, thank you. Dr. Stanley Perlman, if you could be. Uh, good, good morning, I'm Stanley Perlman in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and Pediatrics at the University of Iowa, and my specialty is pediatric infectious diseases and coronaviruses. Great, thank you, Stanley. Dr. Jay Portnoy, our consumer representative. Good morning, uh, I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. I'm also an allergist immunologist in the Division of Allergy Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Thank you, Jay. Dr. Eric Rubin. Good morning. I'm Eric Rubin. I'm at Harvard, uh, the Brigham Women's Hospital, and at the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Dr. Andrea Shin. Good morning, um, I'm Andy Shane. I'm a professor of pediatric infectious diseases at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Uh, my area of interest is uh, in vaccines and vaccine response, uh, especially related to enteric infections. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, next, we will um, do a roll call for our temporary non-voting member, Dr. David Wentworth. David? Good morning. My name is David Wentworth. I'm the chief of the virology surveillance and diagnostics branch in the influenza division. And I'm also um, the U.S. National Influenza Center director and the director of our WHO collaborating center for influenza surveillance, epidemiology, and control. Good great, morning. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning. Um, great. Thanks, everyone. We have a total of 15 participants, 14 voting, and one non-voting member. Um, now I'll proceed with reading the FDA conflict of interest disclosure statement for the public record. Um, the Food and Drug Administration FDA is convening virtually today, October 6, 2022, for the 177th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, FERPAC, under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. Dr. Hannah El-Sawi, is serving as the chair for today's meeting. 
Today on October 6, 2022, the committee will meet in open session to discuss the strain selection for the influenza virus vaccines for the 2023 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties, PMISB. With the exception of the industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting or temporary non-voting members of the VRPAC are appointed special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including, but not limited to, 18 U.S.C. Section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE and SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflict of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purposes of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary non-voting members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S. Code um, Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have, conf uh, who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee's services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interest involved or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultant serving as a temporary non-voting member and speaker for this meeting, Dr. David Wentworth. Dr. David Wentworth is the director, WHO Collaborating Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology and Control of Influenza, and he is employed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as chief of the virology surveillance and diagnosis branch in the influenza division. He is an internationally known expert in influenza virus epidemiology, worldwide influenza disease burden, and influenza virus vaccines. Dr. Wentworth is a regular government employee and has been screened for conflicts of interest and cleared to participate as both a speaker and as a temporary non-voting member for today's meeting. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. As a speaker and temporary non-voting member, Dr. David Wentworth is not only allowed to respond to the clarifying questions from the committee members, but also authorized to participate in the committee discussions in general. However, he is not authorized to participate in the committee voting process. Dr. Paula Annunziato of Merck will serve as the industry representative to this committee. Industry representatives are not appointed as a special government employees and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all related industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Industry representatives on this committee are not screened, do not participate in any closed sessions if held, and do not have voting privileges. Dr. Jay Portnoy is serving as the consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed as special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. 
FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firms, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind members, consultants, and participants that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of the conflicts of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to Dr. Osan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, <clears throat> we will kick off uh, the meeting with Dr. Jerry Weir. Dr. Jerry Weir, Director of the Division of Viral Products, Office of Vaccine Research and Review, CBER FDA. Uh, Dr. Weir will go over influenza virus vaccine strain selection 2023 Southern Hemisphere. Dr. Weir. Um, thank you, Hannah. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm going to just give a very brief uh, introduction to the topic today and essentially to remind everybody why we're here. Uh, I think you guys are going to move my slides for me so you can go ahead to the second slide. Okay, so the purpose of today's VERPAC committee meeting discussion is to make recommendations for the strains of influenza A, H1, N1 and H3N2 and B viruses to be included in the 2023 Southern Hemisphere formulation of influenza vaccines licensed in the United States. So why do we do this? Since 2016, some U.S. manufacturers, actually two to be specific, uh, have been approved to produce a Southern Hemisphere formulation for their influenza vaccine. Both of these manufacturers are egg-based vaccines. Uh, we follow the same strain recommendation and supplement approval process for these manufacturers and these Southern Hemisphere formulations as we do for the Northern Hemisphere process, which usually, as everyone knows, we takes place in February or March for the following year. But it's essentially the same procedure. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so during the presentation today, and this and this is a somewhat abbreviated presentation compared to what we do for the Northern Hemisphere, because as I said, there's only a couple of manufacturers involved and it only applies to the Southern Hemisphere formulation. But you see the same type of data. Uh, you'll get a review of the epidemiology of circulating strains and surveillance data from the US and from around the world. And this is summarized from a recent WHO Southern Hemisphere strain selection consultation. Uh, during that talk, you will hear about antigenic relationships among contemporary viruses and candidate vaccine strains that are available. Uh, a lot of the data will be hemagglutination inhibition and virus neutralization test data using post-infection ferret sera, HI and virus neutralization tests using panels of sera from humans receiving recent inactivated influenza vaccines. Uh, you'll probably be presented some antigenic cartography as well as phylogenetic analysis of HA and NA genes. Next slide. <clears throat> About a year ago, this committee met and made a recommendation for the Southern Hemisphere influenza vaccines for 2022. In other words, the influenza season that's pretty much concluded in the Southern Hemisphere now. The WHO made a recommendation in September, uh, the 24th of September, 2021, and they recommended the following vaccine uh, viruses be used for egg-based trivalent influenza vaccines in the Southern Hemisphere 2022 season. An A. Victoria 2570-2019-H1N1 pandemic-like virus, an A. Darwin 9-2021-H3N2 like virus, and a B. Austria a uh, 135 like virus of the B. Victoria lineage. Uh, they also recommended that any quadrivalent vaccines containing two influenza B strains uh, contain those three strains plus a B. Phuket 3073-2013-like virus from the B. Yamagata lineage. Our VERPAC met on September 30th uh, following that recommendation and made the same recommendation for the U.S. manufacturers of Southern Hemisphere formulations. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, recently, more recently, when we may, met in uh, 
March, we did the recommendations for the Northern Hemisphere vaccines. In other words, the vaccines that are being rolled out about now for use in the United States and other Northern Hemisphere countries. Uh, at that time, in February 25th, the WHO made a recommendation, and they recommended for egg-based vaccines the following viruses be used for trivalent influenza vaccines for the 2022-2023 Northern Hemisphere season. Once again, it was the same. It was actually the same set of, of viruses that were recommended previously for the Southern Hemisphere in 2022: an A. Victoria 2570/2019 H1N1 pandemic-like virus, an A. Darwin 9 2021 H3N2-like virus, and a B. Austria 135/9417 2021-like virus from the B. Victoria lineage. Uh, again, they recommended that a, a, B. Victor, a B. Yamagata strain be included in quadrivalent vaccines, and this was the B-Phuket 3073-2013. Our VRPAC met, uh, reviewed the data, and made the same recommendation on March 3rd, 2022. Next slide. Okay, so more recently, two weeks ago, the WHO met uh, and made a recommendation for the upcoming Southern Hemisphere season. Uh, this was on uh, uh, September 23rd. Uh, there was one change from the previous recommendations, and you'll see they recommended an A. Sydney 5 2021 H1N1 pandemic 09 like virus, in addition to the previously recommended A. Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus, and a B. Austria 1359. 417-2021 like virus from the B. Victoria lineage. Uh, the fourth strain recommended for quadrivalent, quadrivalent vaccines uh, remained the B. Phuket 3073-2013 like virus from the B. Yamagata lineage. So there was one change recommended for the upcoming Southern Hemisphere season. Next slide. Okay, so today, and again, this is an abbreviated presentation and discussion, but the committee will discuss which influenza strains should be recommended for the antigenic composition of the 2023 Southern Hemisphere formulation of influenza virus vaccines produced by licensed U.S. manufacturers. Next slide. Okay, so uh, for the Southern Hemisphere strain selection, we do, as I said, an abbreviated version. We try to make it fairly simple, uh, again, because there's only egg-based vaccines uh, being produced by these two manufacturers. We'll just take two boats. One will be, uh, as shown on the top, will be for the composition of egg-based trivalent 2023 Southern Hemisphere formulations, and we'll ask if the committee recommends the same as what the WHO recommended, and that would be the inclusion of the A. Sydney 5 2021 H1N1 pandemic-like virus, uh, and again, the same A. Darwin and B. Austria viruses that have been recommended previously. And then we'll take a second vote for the quadrivalent formulations uh, because manufacturers can make either a trivalent or a quadrivalent and ask the committee uh, about including the B. Phuket 3073-2013-like virus from the B. Yamagata lineage, lineage as the second influenza B strain. And I think that's all. I can stop. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Weir. Um, do we have, if you have any questions, uh, there's a raise your hand function in the uh, Zoom, with which I hope we're all familiar now. And I do not see any hand. Well, I do see a couple of hands. Uh, Dr. Portnoy. Great, thing. thank you, Dr. Weir. Uh, I'm still a little bit puzzled about the need for the FDA to review vaccines that are going to be delivered in the Southern Hemisphere because the United States is in the Northern Hemisphere. I know that these two companies asked for <laughs> FDA approval, but don't the countries where the vaccine is going to be delivered have their own FDA? And are they using this FDA as a proxy for their FDA? Or what's, what's the reason for that? Why do they want the United States FDA to approve uh, vaccines that will not be delivered in the United States? <clears throat> well, okay. So, yes, th this comes up almost every year. Um, it's sort of a two-part answer. Uh, I can't answer for every country. <laughs> and so some of them may want to do this, but but you're right. A lot of them do have their own regulatory agencies. But it's the, the vaccine itself is licensed in the United States produced by a U.S. manufacturer. So that's why we go through the process to make sure that if they're producing this under their license, that they follow the procedure just like they do for anything else. 
But you're right, it probably does vary from country to country for how it is used and how that recommendation is used. But, but are they allowed? Are they not allowed to produce the vaccine without FDA approval if it's not going to be given in the United States? Or do they have to have FDA approval just to manufacture it? No. I, okay. So actually, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, I do think that these companies can make Southern Hemisphere vaccines without going through the FDA approval process. It's just if they do it under their license, that's what this is the process we have to follow. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bernstein. And thank you for that uh, overview, Dr. Ware. I just had uh, one question, and that is, uh, what's the rationale for continuing to produce a trivalent influenza vaccine uh, when it seems quadrivalent should be the direction around the world? Uh, well, you might get some pushback now whether quadrivalent is really that necessary, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Wentworth will will talk about that. But uh, basically, that's a marketing decision. Uh, companies are licensed to produce trivalent or quadrivalent, and they can produce whatever they think that they can sell and, and they can market. Uh, in the United States, we don't force them to do one or the other, but you're right. The, the trend has been toward uh, quadrivalent vaccines for several years, and the amount of quadrivalent vaccine produced and utilized in the United States has, of course, gone up dramatically compared to, to trivalent. Uh, I think most public health officials would have said over the last few years that a quadrivalent vaccine uh, is probably a better choice because the two strain, the two lineages of, of, of influenza B have co-circulated for a long time. But again, as you'll hear in a few minutes, uh, that, that situation is somewhat changing. So uh, we could be asking a different question before long about how much, uh, uh, whether the quadrivalent really does have much of an advantage over a trivalent. Anyway, ever-evolving situation. Thank you. All right, with that sneak peek uh, on the data, uh, we now turn the meeting over to Dr. David Wentworth. Dr. David Wentworth is the director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Surveillance Epidemiology and Control of Influenza and is the Chief of Virology Surveillance and Diagnosis Branch Influenza Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Wentworth will go over the global, survey, global influenza virus surveillance and characterization. Dr. Wentworth. Thanks, Dr. Asali. I'm going to um, walk you through um, a, a kind of a, a, brief, a brief version of what we discussed at the, um, at the meeting. And what I'm going to do, actually, I kind of want to turn off my video before I start real quick here. Sorry, just to make sure we have bandwidth. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention is I've worked hard to make sure this is 508 compliant. If anyone that has vision impairments can't, can't understand some of the slides, please let FDA know and we'll make sure we get that sorted out. Um, okay. So the outline is to briefly describe the consultation meeting for the Southern Hemisphere 2023 recommendations, and also a little bit about the influenza activity. I wanna detail quite a bit about the H1N1 PDM09 viruses. That's the one that uh, Dr. Weir mentioned is updated. And uh, then also discuss, we spend equally or more um, amounts of time on the H3N2 viruses and the B viruses, um, but we'll just cover those briefly because they remained unchanged. And I'll show you some data that, that relates to why they weren't changed. So just a brief update on the meeting. It's, it really b benefits from continuous surveillance conducted by the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System. This is a network of laboratories that I'll call GISRIS all the time. Uh, its birthday this year is a 70-year 70, 70 birthday, so it's been existing for a very long time, and it's played a huge role in our response to the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic or COVID-19 pandemic. We have WHO CCs, which uh, the, w the CDC is one of them. Um, and NICS, National Influenza Centers, WHO Essential Regulatory Laboratories like the FDA, WHO H5 Reference Laboratories all contribute, and we're supported by a number of countries and partners, uh, over 150. 
Um, the consultation was held from the 19th through the 22nd. It still remains a hybrid meeting. We had a couple of folks, Diane Wong, the, the CNIC director from China, and John McCauley were uh, in, the, in the beginning of the meeting. He was uh, also virtual and he came towards the end. It was chaired by Dr. Hideki Hasegawa and I was the co-chair. And we have 10 advisors, uh, directors of WHO CCs and ERLs, eight advise on seasonal influenza and two focus on zoonotic viruses. And I won't cover the zoonotic recommendations for pre-pandemic vaccines today. And then uh, you're used to all of this. I see there are some new members, so I won't I won't run too fast. Um, there's 35 observers and experts from WHO uh, regional offices and HQ. So Dr. Weir just covered all this. I won't belabor it. The big change was Sydney. We make recommendations for both egg-based platforms and cell culture or recombinant based platforms. And even when viruses have the same name, like Sydney 5, they do, um, there is a different prototype often. There's a cell culture prototype with a different accession number than the egg prototype has. So there's sometimes isolate specific differences. And I wanted to point that out so that people can uh, go to this technical report and, and go to the reagents part of the WHO recommendations and identify which uh, which may be the best for their cell culture recombinant based vaccines or if they're developing new vaccines. So um, now we're going to stop and look at the number of influenza specimens that are positive, that are positive influenza specimens. And you can see we had this kind of flat period during the COVID-19 pan, early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as my English friends say, the last proper influenza season was January 2020. And you can actually see a rapid decline, decline here as the COVID-19 pandemic came up. So there was definitely impacts by that. But now you can see that we're back and we had uh, basically two kinds of seasons, a, a smaller one in the Northern Hemisphere and then a, 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 big, a little bit bigger one in the Southern Hemisphere. This is color coded, these bar charts. The light blue is H1M1 PDM09. The, the kind of aqua color is H3. Uh, and the dark color is just not subtyped. BVIC lineage is the orange and Yamagata the light yellow and uh, be not determined is the darker burnt orange colors. And that's just to give you a flavor. To get into the percentage of influenza A viruses by subtype and lineage, uh, this pie chart illustrates it. And over here, we've described it. The specimens characterized between February and 30 August 2022, 95% were type A with 26, 27% of those being H3N2 and close to 2%, 1.7 being H1M1 PDM09 and 67% not typed. For the B viruses, the 3.2% were type B and all the samples that had lineage determined, which is 1.5% of the total samples were B Victoria lineage. Now, this slide illustrates the global distribution of influenza viruses around the world here. And it also has a key here where you can see the, the viruses by type, subtype in the various uh, WHO transition zones, transmission zones. Um, and this is between February and August 2022. And you can see that for the most part, there was a lot of type A and often it was H3 viruses. Um, there were parts of Northern Africa where B dominated, and uh, China had an interesting scenario where B initi you know, initially dominated, and then uh, H3 came in. Um, I'll move on. So I'm going to get into the H1M1 PDM09 viruses specifically. This slide shows the number of H1M1 PDM09 viruses detected by GISRIS over the past four years. We have 2019. You can see it was a pretty normal looking year, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And so you can see 2021 as we as we go through the year, and then we come into 2022 with the red line, you know, merging from yellow to red. We have basically very close to baseline. This is a pretty big access, you know, 5,000 here. And so you can see some blips and it's it's actually moved up above uh, the, the very flat line that it has. But H1N1 viruses has still been relatively rare compared to H3N2 amongst the influenza A's, as I described on the earlier pie chart slide. Looking at where in the world the H1N1 virus is circulated, this slide illustrates that. The percent positivity is color-coded here on this 
key with uh, light yellows being zero to 5% positive, a little bit darker, five to 10. And as you get into the burnt oranges and the red, you're getting to 10, 20, and greater than 30%. And so that you can see there was mild uh, H1 activity in a number of countries around the world. And some countries like South Africa, Kenya, France had quite a bit of H1 activity. Now, this is a high-level view of uh, the phylogeography of the viruses, and this is uh, provided by data. So uh, all the CCs contribute a lot of genetic sequence data to GISAID, and it's pulled by our colleagues in Cambridge, uh, Dr. Sarah James and Derek Smith. Um, and we can do these uh, you know, very high-level trees, these mega trees. And to the right of that, you can see a heat map illustrating which countries these viruses appeared in and in which months. And at the top, I've labeled the year, so from 2019 through 2022. So two major 6B1A5A subclades emerged um, prior to the COVID pandemic and descendants continue to circulate. And two of these, 5A1 and 5A2, kind of made their way through the COVID bottleneck. And so you can see that bottleneck here, just not very many tick marks in the 2020 era. But then we saw emergence in Africa, for example, of 5A1s. So over here on the far right, we have the key for the 5A1s. So they're this big branch of viruses, 5A1s. And then this big branch over here is 5A2s. And you can see they were both co-circulating before the pandemic. The 5A1s existed earlier and the 5A2s emerged later, and that led to a strain change. And so you can see that the 5A2s have continued to diversify more where the tree is more flat in the 5A1s. And they have, they've, while they've continued to circulate, they haven't diversified as much genetically. Um, and so you can see that the 5A2, and I'll call it going into more detail in a closer up tree next, but the 5A2 circulated most recently in Oceania. You can see this pink color. This is Australia. The green dashes are Europe. Orange is Africa. And red is China and, and Asia in general. So you can see it's circulating more globally, whereas the 5A1s were primarily in Europe, a few detected in the US or North America, and uh, preceding that, quite a few in African countries. So now this is kind of important, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the H1 phylogeography of recent viruses and just walk you through this tree. And so the previous tree was kind of driving down in, in evolution where the two clades split. And this tree is now going up really from the older viruses being at the bottom. Idaho 7 was a previous vaccine virus, for example, it's way down here in the bottom. And so in the bottom of this tree, we have the 6B1A 5A1s, and I'll call them 5A1s from now on. These often share this D187A and Q189E substitution. I've labeled that here. You can see the small print, but this is where the branch point is for that D187A group. And all of these viruses are in that clade 5A1. It's color-coded by this pink bar here. We also... Um, do tick marks here, and now this is just all 2022 from February to August, and so you can see which months these viruses circulated, and you can see that a lot of these viruses circulated in Europe, um, and but the tree is relatively flat, so they look very similar to viruses that circulated previously. We did have the emergence of these very unique groups that we pay a lot of attention to, this P137S and G155E, and that's uh, like this North Carolina O2, and where we've labeled these, uh, these viruses, and sometimes I include them in the bullets here, they're going to show up later in the human serology, and we always uh, generally make ferret antisera and test a bunch of viruses against those as well. And so this is a position of importance, 155 in particular, and so we track those viruses very closely. And here in 5A2, represented by the A Wisconsin 588 virus, that's the, the vaccine prototype here in red, and the Victoria 2570. So Wisconsin was the cell-based and, and Victoria 2570, the egg-based. These all share this, this group of substitutions here, labeled by the N156K, K130N, 156K, L161I, V250A, and E506D, which is in the HA2 portion of the molecule. And what you can appreciate, this is a, a tree showing genetic distance, is these guys have derived gone further genetic distance, as I mentioned before. And now nearly all the 5A2 viruses circulating have at least these substitutions here characterized at this 186T mark. 
K154R, the A186T, the Q189E, E224A, and then these other guys. And they're really represented by this India Pune NIV3235462021. And so that's going to be one of the serology engines I show you. They further diversified a very small subgroup uh, identified in Africa, such as this A Ghana2711 has this uh, additional changes at 137S and uh, 142R, which has actually preceded it in the evolution. Okay, and so there uh, recently viruses primarily from Africa, Europe, and Oceania are, are seen there. And you can see that again in the color coding here, whereas the color coding here is primarily Europe and Africa with a few in Oceania. I also wanted to point out the parallel evolution of 189E, and you'll see that better. But basically, both of these subgroups now, 5A1s and 5A2s, have uh, acquired the 189E independently. Some people call that convergent evolution. So, um, so this is one I rarely show. It's always one we look at, but this is called a Seq logo. So I'll walk you through this. I know some of you are probably familiar, but we put the we take all the samples collected from a certain time frame in a window. Here's about 1,200 samples that we've sequenced, and since February, and it helps us start to identify positions under selection. And so it doesn't really matter which clade they're in. We can see the positions under selection easier. And so the the, the Seq logo logo part of it is the frequency of zero to one is shown here. And then the size of the letter for that a particular amino acid at position 101 all the way through 250 is what I'm showing you here, illustrates about what proportion in the virus population it has that letter at that position. The other piece is underneath here, we're showing where the key antigenic epitopes are, antigenic sites on the HA molecule, so site SA. R stands for receptor binding site. Uh, CA is another epitope, SA, SB. Okay. And so what, what I really wanted to point out is that the finding mutations in the 5A1 are position 156. And you can see an even split really here with the asparagine being the 5A1 and the lysine being 5A2. And they're smack in the middle of site SA um, at 156. And then we see a little bit with 137S, um, but that's more contributed by the 5A2. And 155E, it's probably very difficult to see here, but there's a tiny little E here. And so that's just telling you there's not much of that virus around. Now, with the 5A2, the defining characteristics are that 156K, as I already pointed out, 130N and 161I. And so all of them will have that. But you'll also see the recent 5A2 all have 186T, which you can see over here and um, 189E. And so this is what I meant about the convergent evolution. 5A2s used to uh, have the original amino acid there. So but both the 5A1s and 5A2s now in site SB have uh, a, a glutamic acid in that position. And then we have the 224A. And so you can see that uh, down here. And that's in the receptor binding domain. And that, that can contribute to antigenic escape as well. So we pay attention to those. And then there's some parallel evolution, which I already mentioned. So now to help you identify where these are on the HA molecule, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the India Pune NIV, which is one of our serology engines you'll see later and where the changes are relative to the Wisconsin 588 vaccine virus. And um, you can kind of picture this, this bottom part here is where the virus would be. So the viral envelope is down here and the HA goes up and the HA1 top here, the head domain, which is the major antigenic site is at the top of this molecule. I'm only showing you a monomer for simplicity, but it's actually a trimer with all these changes in a trimeric feature. So what I wanted to point out was just some of these changes that we're seeing. The 224A, this is near the receptor binding site, so that's impacting that. The 186T and the 189E are right up here in the head of the molecule in site SB. And then Ghana, which is that group I mentioned that has gone a little further evolutionarily, has all those changes and then has this 142R and 137S. And they are in the site CA. So I, I actually should have mentioned what these color codes are. This peach color here is site SA. The blue color is site SB. And the green is site CA and the yellow is site CB. And these orange uh, markings are 
uh, glycosylation sites, and the red indicates amino acid changes at those positions. So really, all this is to give you a sense of there's important changes happening molecularly on the surface of the molecule in antigenic sites that we understand are important. When we conduct antigenic analysis of the H1N1PDM09 viruses across all the centers, which are listed here, um, we consider them either like or low to the vaccine. So two to four fold reactivity patterns are considered like the vaccine or the, or the serum from ferrets immunized with Wisconsin 588, for example, is neutralizing those viruses well. And just when you get to the, to the first dilution that would be you know some reductions that you can really uh, nail down is an eightfold. And that's where we start to wonder if the virus is escaping better. So what you can see is overall, nearly 80% of the viruses tested are reacting well to Wisconsin 588-like virus. And the same is true for the egg-based Victoria uh, antigen. And we're getting good reactivity there. One thing I would point out is the Francis Crick Institute, which gets a lot of, they're in London, they get a lot of viruses from Europe. And you can see it's a little bit different pattern there. Remember, they had a lot of 5A1s in Europe. And so this is a 5A2 antigen. And so with ferrets, we would expect that to be a little bit lower. Now here it goes deep into the data. I know no one likes to look at HI tables, but they're actually more informative than cartography. And but but that's really, you know, it's easier to show cartography. But I wanted to point out a couple of things on this on this panel. This is from our colleagues at Vidral and the, the CC in Australia. Um, here, I'll just walk you through some of the sera and the reference antigens. This is Guangdong Mayonan, so that's a 5A1 virus. And the cell-based version of that is Vic. 2455, and a Togo 881 is a little bit different flavor, 5A1 that was found in Africa in 2020. And so we've got sera to each of those viruses, and you can see their reactivity pattern highlighted in bold, so they have pretty good homologous titers. And then when you test them against 5A2, they're all below 80. And so we get this very binary pattern. In contrast, when we test uh, VIC-2570, um, cell-based, which is basically the same as Wisconsin 588. That's their cultivar for the cell vaccine. And then the egg-based VIC-2570. See the homologous titers here, reacting very well with the 5A2 viruses and not well with the 5A1 viruses. And that's what I meant by the binary pattern. Here we have Sydney 5. This is the new recommended prototype. And so you can see that that uh, has a good titer and reacts very well with all the 5A1 viruses and again, poorly with the 5A2. Now, while ferrets are a very good model for influenza viruses, we've known in most recent years, particularly with the H1M1 PDM09 subtype of H1s, that they don't, they're immunodominant to site SA, where the 156 changes that the 5A2 viruses have, and they don't react as much to site SB. And so what you can see is, while the most recently circulating viruses from South Africa, for example, are reacting well here, when we look at the human serum pool from people vaccinated that included the Wisconsin 588, or actually the Victoria 2570 vaccine, this was an egg-based vaccine pool, you can see some reductions in those most recent viruses. And we're going to get into more detail with that with the human serology studies, but I wanted to point it out here. All right, so here's cartography. A lot of people like this because it's easy to differentiate what's going on. So uh, hopefully you can see the light gray squares within this box. Um, they indicate twofold reductions. And so what we're doing here is comparing viruses to each other and to serum raised against different viruses. And this clusters viruses is antigenically similar to each other or, or uh, different from each other. And as you get each, each light gray square represents a twofold kind of reduction or difference between the different viruses. Now the color coded viruses here, the red is the 5A2, they have the 156K. The green is 5A1, which there's none on this map anymore. And the, the blue, for some reason, the, the, the key didn't show up right, but they're the 156N, they're shown here with the Guangdong Mayonan viruses. And so clearly, these are antigenically distinct groups of clusters of viruses. And you can see this is all the viruses that were tested in the CC in Melbourne by hemagglutination inhibition since March 2022. And all the older viruses that have been tested previously are shown in gray. So you can kind of see where those two groups have been circulating for a while. 
So each virus clades, clusters together. And if you look at the Victoria egg, it's down here in the Sydney cell. The newly recommended vaccine is a little bit closer to the middle of the cluster. And here's the egg. Now here is adult human post-vaccination sera and looking at the individual responses. And so this is results from our, our collaborating center here. These are people that were immunized. Uh, these are a sera from Australia, kindly provided by our colleagues in Vidral. Um, and they were immunized with a cell-based vaccine or an egg-based inactivated vaccine. And then the elderly population had an adjuvanted egg-based vaccine. And I'm just going to walk you through a few of these key features. So at the top, we're illustrating some of the key changes in the uh, HA of the virus um, since the, the Wisconsin 588 uh, cell-based vaccine, which everything will be compared against here. And so with the India Pune, for example, here's the egg-based is VIC2570. The next one over has the 186T, 189E, and 224A that I told you almost all the viruses share now. And then there's a Connecticut 01, which is just like that, but has an additional change at 216, so one additional change. And then there's the Ghana 2711 viruses, which have the 137S and 142 substitutions, so those site CA substitutions. And then we also include 5A1s. Those are co-circulating. We saw a lot of those in Europe. These are kind of the older viruses. The previous vaccine for those was Hawaii 70. And so uh, that's included as a serology antigen. And North Carolina too is one of the unusual virus with the 155E substitution. And no, that's just one amino acid away from 156, which we know is important as well. So one of the things I want to point out with this individual ones, and this is something that we're including in part because Verpac has asked us to show um, more on the human serology individual data. So these are these bubble plots, and the blue indicates pre-vaccination, what the individuals looked like. The size of the bubble indicates how many uh, folks were had that same kind of titer. And then the line with the number is the geometric mean titer. Okay, and so you can see the pre-vaccination, the geometric mean was, again, 588, the, 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 the homologous antigen that they were being vaccinated with, with for flu cell vax, for example, was 7, and it jumped up to 188, so pretty good response with greater than 80% of them having fourfold conversions and titers greater than 40, which is a correlate of protection. I won't spend a lot of time on the Vic egg virus, but basically similar results. And the, the other good news is the majority of viruses circulating look like this, and we see a good response to those as well, uh, with the majority of people with a GMT of 153. And then the, the, the Connecticut, which has that additional change, a slightly lower GMT. And then we get into more reduction with the Ghana. And I'll show you this with some statistical power behind it. The other point I want to make is the back boost. So what you can see is these viruses and vir the 5A viruses before they diversified into the 5A1s circulated in our population in 2019, 2018, and, and 2020 and, and in that period. And they were in our vaccine. And so when we vaccinate with the 5A2, we're actually seeing a pretty good boost against this unrelated clade that you would not see in a naive ferret, for example. And so that's good news. And we actually see a pretty good boost of this new, very odd North Carolina 2 5A1 virus. And so that's what I mean by the forward boost. And so the forward boosting is these recent viruses, we still get a boost. It's much better than not being vaccinated where your GMTs are well below 40. And this is basically similar pattern we see for IV, not as quite as high as the GMT titers and in the elderly population with the adjuvant. Sometimes the elderly actually fare better with these uh, back boost type events. Um, okay, so the lowest GMTs were the Ghana 2711. I wanted to make that point, so I put it in the bullet. Now, here we're looking at um, the results using a little bit more standard assay, and this is a statistical analysis of the GMT ratios uh, showing the inhibition by vaccine-induced antibodies. And what you can see, I'll just have you follow my pointer, which is an advantage with this particular presentation here. These are GMT reductions versus the propagated cell Wisconsin. So we set that at 100 um, in all the responses. And what you can see is 
With the India Pune, you get a little bit of a reduction in the 90% confidence interval shown uh, on either side of that point estimate. In Connecticut, a slightly more reduction. And then the Ghana, a more significant reduction with this dashed line being a 50% mark, which we use to, to kind of really divide uh, viruses from this non-inferiority analysis. Uh, so all these, all these viruses above the line would be considered non-inferior. And this one below the line has, is potentially inferior. So the vaccine would be potentially inferior for viruses like this. So the 5A1, that's the similar phenomenon here. And then again, looking at the IV4, we see the same pattern. You know, pe different people, different vaccine, same pattern. The elderly, different people, different vaccine with different immune history, pretty much the same pattern. All right, so the India Pune and, and Connecticut show modest reductions, and they have these changes. And this is really what the majority of viruses have, are these, these three that I mentioned here, the 186, 189, 224. The additional changes kind of push it over the edge in the site CA um, and drive that down. Similar results, I won't spend as much time on these, but the MHRA, which used to be the NIBSC, uh, has the from the U, their UK uh, panels from both the Northern Hemisphere and the same Southern Hemisphere serum provided by Australia uh, had a similar phenomenon with the Victoria 2570 egg being the the, the the one that they're testing against here. Then the Connecticut, which is the same virus we tested against, drops down. It's in this diamond. Okay. And then these in Trieste in Italy and Qatar, um, also have a similar pattern. They have similar look. And then the South Africa, which is like our Ghana strain, has this 137S and 142. You can see drops down quite a bit. So similar patterns across different centers with these different viruses. This is a compilation of all the data. The, uh, the, the blue means they're statistically non-inferior, particularly if they have a check mark. Uh, in the box, and the, oh, as you get into the brighter orange, they get to be uh, basically potentially inferior, uh, the, or the vaccine would be inferior for those antigens is a better way I should say that. So in general, what you see is these, uh, these antigens that are the newer 5A2 viruses are the ones where we're getting more of the orange across different centers like the NIBSC or the CDC uh, and, and, uh, and other locations. So to just summarize that clearly, it really shows that the 5A2 genes have accumulated changes in epitopes such as SB, uh, such that they better escape antibodies induced by the current vaccine antigens. And the additional changes in, at 137S and 142R in the site CA further reduce the human antibody recognition. So to summarize the H1s, globally, there were relatively few viruses with collection dates after January 2022 that have been detected. But the great work of GISRIS and all of our partners scour these viruses, send them to the WHO CCs, and we can do comprehensive analysis of what's circulating. The HA genes are all in clade 6B1A5A, which is the base clade of all of these viruses that I showed in my little tree over here. And they've split into the two subclades, 5A1, which have that 187, 189 substitution, and they predominantly circulated in Europe. And the 5A2, which circulated globally, and we've gone over these amino acid changes, so I won't read them out, but that's the base. And then the majority of them now also have acquired additional all have acquired these additional changes, the Q54A186T, Q189E, like the 5A1, and the E224A, R259K, and K308R. And so that uh, Sydney 5 is an example of a virus like that. It has a couple of addition mutations, such as the 216 substitution as well. So anagenically, this is the anagenic summary. Our analysis showed that the 5A1 and 5A2 form two distinct groups. That's clear in the cartography. The fair antisera to the Sydney 5 prototype, both the cell and the egg, well-recognized representative 5A2 viruses, so contemporary 5A2 viruses. And then the analysis with the human post-vaccination sera showed that the 5A2 HA genes have accumulated changes that facilitate escape from antibodies that are induced by the current vaccine antigens. And we saw that porous inhibition with those that had the additional changes in that uh, K142R and P137S.
but they represent a very small proportion of circulating viruses presently. So now on to the H3N2 viruses. This shows the number detected. It's the same kind of look we showed you for the H1N1, but you can see now these most recent periods, as we come out of uh, 2021, we saw an increasing number. And as you move into 2022, it started to fall. And then as the Southern Hemisphere picked up quite early and um, pretty much flatlined, this decline in between weeks probably 31 and 36 is probably an artifact of reporting delays. So I wouldn't take that as a sharp decline being accurate. This slide again, you've seen this before with the H1N1, shows the H3N2 activity. If you can remember back to that slide, that had a lot more light yellow in it. And it's just illustrating how much more H3N2 influenza A viruses there were than H1N1 viruses. You can see the countries uh, and geographic regions in general where they circulated. In Northern Europe, we had quite a bit of virus around. The one issue, I, I apologize, this download, there was a glitch in the WHO site. Australia should be almost red. It was close to 30% positivity, if not more. So it's it's got a high amount of H3N2 activity, and they had a lot of viruses to analyze, at, at our colleagues in Vidral. So I apologize, that's not indicated there. Um, you'll see that in some of the, the data with the phylogenies and the phylogeography, as I'm going to show you here. So two major clades survived the bottleneck of COVID-19, the 2A1B1s, which are these red viruses, the small little group up here. And the reason these are all red dashes here are because they circulate in Asia and primarily in China. Then the 2A2s really have a global distribution. Um, and so this, this two, I should have just kind of oriented you. This 2A group is this whole, uh, this whole bar here, the 2A1Bs, the 3C2A1Bs, the major clade. And then we're going to get into the 2A1B, 2A1, and I'll just call them 2A1 and 2A2. And so you can see the 2A2s just have this global distribution. Darwin uh, 9 egg sits in the 2A2 group, and Darwin 6 cell sit in the 2A2 group. Uh, they're actually quite proximal when on certain trees. This slide is a little bit easier to see. It's from our colleagues at uh, NextFlu, um, led by Trevor Bedford and Richard Nahar and their colleagues I've listed here. We work with them closely on fitness forecasting. And each of these X's represents previous uh, vaccine viruses. So it's a very simple tree to look at. And so it doesn't contain as much detail. But the, the 2A2 viruses sit here in this kind of olive branch or uh, brownish branch here. And the previous vaccine was the 2A1 vaccine, the Cambodia E08362. Uh, I've forgotten the last part of the number, but you remember the Cambodia vaccine. And you can see that there's still some of these 2A1 viruses circulating. And these were circulating as a time tree. These were circulating in China. But the vast majority of viruses circulating around the world are, are 2A2s. And they've split into two kind of major subgroups, the D53G with the H156S subgroup. And that's this blue group here that Darwin 6 uh, sits in. And Darwin 9 is right in there as well. And the D53N h 156S group, which is the, the green dots up towards the top. And I'm not going to show you a really detailed tree with all the amino acid changes, but I'll cover some of the important ones in the serology antigens. This shows you the clade turnover um, uh, in, in the various countries which clades are circulating. Uh, again, the pie charts indicating 2A2 being the dark green and the 2A1 being the olive green. And so you can just cast your eye across this entire map and you really only see olive green in a few places. Uh, Timor-Leste was one of them over here that had some of those viruses, uh, but they were primarily in China. And the rest of the world saw 2A2. This is analysis by ferret antisera to recommended vaccine antigens for the Southern Hemisphere 2022, which is the recommendation for 2023, Darwin 6, the cell-based, and Darwin 9, the egg-based. And what you can see is uh, across all the centers, uh, we had really good data against this Darwin 6 antigen. So antisera to Darwin 6 neutralized the recent circulating viruses very well. Um, some centers had quite a few to test by, and this is just virus neutralization assay. Uh, Vidral tested many, many viruses as well by uh, HI assay. And I'm just not going to show you that data because it's very consistent with this. 
We do see a little bit of a decline in an egg-based antigen, and that's quite common in an H3 uh, phenomenon. The egg-based vaccines have, have to acquire more uh, amino acid substitutions to replicate to high titers in eggs for the H3 viruses. But it uh, really shows there's not much antigenic drift going on. Even though we're seeing genetic changes, we're not seeing antigenic changes. And that's illustrated here in the cartography. So our colleagues, Sarah Smith and Derek, uh, Sarah James and Derek Smith at the University of Cambridge, take the HI and neutralization. This is HI data from Melbourne uh, that is produced and graph it for us. So you can see this cart cartograph. And we've broken out, and I'll spend more time on these 2A2 viruses. I can easily point out, these are the 2A1s down here where Cambodia, EO826360, that's the number I couldn't remember, cell virus is sitting right in the middle of the old 2A1 viruses, and just very few of those circulating. We had a, there was a 1A and a 1B still circulating uh, in, in that, uh, that uh, our colleagues at Midroll could test. But there's a lot of the 2A2 viruses and this is the position of the egg and the cell antigens in that cartograph. And then we have broken out by color, whether they have the 156S, the 156S with 53N, or 53G. And what you can see is there's a relatively even mixture of those viruses in this antigenic space or in this, this grouping. So there's not huge antigenic distinctions yet between those subgroups. That's what I make by this bullet point here. They're antigenically closely related. And really similar data was seen across the th three centers here that I'm showing you. Um, the London, again, using HI, and then CDC, um, we were using something called HINT, which is high contrast imaging neutralization test. So this is a virus neutralization test rather than a hemagglutination inhibition test. And it does provide a little bit more granular data. And so you can see some, some separation of these groups that maybe uh, are interspersed in, by HI, but they're still antigenically all closely related to each other. Now, um, human post-vaccination sera, so the same sera that I described for the uh, H1N1 viruses was used for the H3N2. And you remember the color coding we have here, blue being non-inferior. You're really looking at many flavors of 2A2 viruses that were tested. We had viruses, um, you know, the Darwin-6 is the homologous antigen that we're comparing to for flu cell vax, for example. And we have Maryland 2, which has the 156S, 157L. These dominated uh, the viruses in the United States last year. They were the predominant kind of uh, subclade within 2A2. We have Alaska 01, which has a carbohydrate change at 96, at, at the position 96. So that's sometimes a big deal. And the 192F, we see a minor reduction, but look at the GMT is still 113. So that's not so bad. And then uh, the Pennsylvania 01 is another subgroup. And the E50K, um, I should have pointed that out on the next strain view, but there was a small group of kind of purple viruses towards the bottom of that view. And that's what that this one is. And there, there are not very many of these around, but we wanted to test them. And then we see, again, good back boost against the 2A1 Cambodia virus. So that's good. So to summarize the H3N2, this predominated globally. Yeah, here's this little uh, 50K virus group that I, I meant to point out before. Um, the HA father genetics show that the HA of the majority of circulating H3N2 viruses are 2A2. They continue to diversify. We've talked about these changes. Um, remember the vaccine viruses in, in this group. So uh, the HA1 subclade 2A1 viruses really predominated in China, and that's the only place we saw them. And they're clearly antigenically distinct, which I'm going to show you here. Uh, just to remind you what we cover, the ferret antisera against Darwin 6 and Darwin 9 really well recognized the majority of the viruses circulating in this period. And circulating 2A2s are clearly distinct from 2A1 viruses. The human serology studies show that the individuals vaccinated with the, the current vaccine viruses had good recognition and good neutralization of viruses for, with HAs from multiple 2A2 subclades, for example, D53N and D53G. So now on to the influenza B viruses. Here we're looking at the global circulation of the influenza B viruses from 2018 through 2022. 
Um, the, the, again, we have color coding with B. Victoria being green, so you can see the different epidemics when they're happening, B. Yamagata being blue, and a lineage not determined being orange. And it typically corresponds, you know, proportionally with if you were to do the lineage determination. And towards the discussion at the beginning of this uh, meeting, we talked about Yamagata lineage. So the last kind of proper Yamagata epidemic was 2018. And the blue, you can't quite see it, but it's flatlined since then. And what we've seen when we've seen influenza B, such as in 2020 and now in 2022, um, was B Victoria viruses. And so the focus will be on B Victoria viruses. That's also illustrated here without the timing. From February to August, all the viruses that had lineage determination, which was 79% of them, were B Victoria viruses. There were zero B Yamagata viruses confirmed by a collaborating center. Sometimes there's some detections by PCR, but when we, they're sent into collaborating centers, they can't be confirmed either due to very high CTs or other issues. So here we're looking again at the activity around the globe. And we did see some good influenza activity uh, for influenza B. You know, we have uh, zero to 5% positive in a, in a wide variety of countries across, across the globe. And then some countries, like for example, in Africa, we had uh, Egypt, for example, had a very high positivity rate. And I mentioned China in the beginning of the talk uh, where they had kind of an early season, of, there was a lot of Bs going around and then it switched over to H3s. Um, so China had a lot of B viruses. And they were all BVIC. So we'll talk about the B Victoria. Again, it's, it's quite a similar story across all, all, all the lineage I'm going to describe. We're kind of having two co-circulating uh, primary clades that have, have uh, kind of made their way through the COVID bottleneck. And so for the influenza Bs, the nomenclature is the main clade 1A with a 3A subclade, and that was diversified into 3A.1 and 3A.2. And that's shown over here. So the 1A3 emerged quite a while back. You can see them. Uh, they were a triple deletion variant, uh, 162 to 164, which is an antigenic loop in the hemagglutinin molecule. And then uh, there was some quiet time during COVID, and then it reemerged. You know, in Asia, you can see quite a bit of these 1A3 viruses with the 150K, 184E, 197D, and R279K. And these then split into these two groups that I'll spend time talking about. The 3A1s, which have the V220M, and they primarily circulated in China, and the 3A2s, which really diversified, I mean, which really disseminated globally. And it's kind of hard to see at this high level tree. I'm going to dry, dive you down into a, one of our trees that gets into some detail here. We still have some older 1A3 viruses, descendants of this 183 group. So here's B Iowa and B Washington. B Washington was the most recent vaccine in the 1A3 group. We have some descendants related to that that were first identified in Kenya, but then circulated more in the Netherlands recently. And you can see those were in April, May, and June, they were detected. And they've acquired a couple of additional changes. So I'm pointing those out because, uh, you know, they're kind of still are hanging around and they've acquired additional changes. And so we're going to include this B Kenya in the serology data. I'll show you. Um, the 3A1, as I've already mentioned, you can see all this red here. They primarily circulated in China. They have this V220M that I've boxed in red and uh, P241R. Um, and it's represented by the Sejuan Xinyang. 120, 48, 2019 virus. And you can see they've continued to circulate a bit. Um, and then they've also got in China now a turnover. So they've really replaced the 3A1 viruses with 3A2s, which are uh, categorized primarily by these first branch of the tree at the A127T, P144L, K203R. So they're listed here. The B Austria is kind of near the base of that group. Okay, that's the current vaccine recommendation and the vaccine recommendation for 2023 for the Southern Hemisphere. In China, they've acquired primarily that we see them there are these H122Q. So that's included as a serology antigen. The B Henyan Jingyang, pardon my pronunciation, uh, will be there. And then we've seen further evolution uh, post the, the 182, 197E221 grouping here 
represented by beat Maryland, for example. And then a lot of them have this just D197E, so parallel evolution at that site, very small change, you know, aspartic acid to glutamic acid uh, with the Massachusetts one. So I think I covered all the things in these bullets here, which are to help people that have visual impairments as well. Okay. So the global B Victoria HA clade diversity here, what I'm illustrating or what we are trying to illustrate, I should say, is the, the period from September 1st to January 1st, and then the more recent period, and just try to illustrate how the clades have changed in, in various countries. The main one to focus at is the kind of the decrease in this 3A1, the dark blue viruses in China. They represent about a quarter of the pie in this period. And also some continuing lingering of the B1A3 base, base clade virus. But really, a more swing over to more 3A2, which are the aqua colored viruses. And you can see that in the same country. It's always uh, nice when you're looking at fitness, viral fitness, to have viruses that are co circulating in the same uh, counties, even um, in the same countries. And this is an easier way to see that clade turnover, but it doesn't show you the geography of the clade turnover. So you can see early February 1, uh, this time last year, this period last year for 2021, uh, there was a lot more 3A1 viruses around and they've just continued to decrease uh, to about 5% now. And the 3A2 viruses have continued to increase. And there's just a few of these uh, base viruses hanging around. So antigenic analysis, again, using the vaccine antigen sera as a summary um, for the cell and the egg. Again, good matching here between the cell and the egg across most of the centers. Even see Nick now, they, previously they had a lot more of those, uh, the, the 3A1 viruses, but now they have um, more of the same types of viruses we're seeing globally. And you can see 92% of the viruses are well recognized by Sera against the B. austria. And that same is true for the B. austria egg component. Here's some nice cartography illustrating uh, the, this, this group here, the V1A3, like here, 3A2 in the, in the kind of green color. Um, and then some of the breakdown of the 3A2 with 122Q, which you can see a lot of in the Beijing data, and not very much of that in the data from the Atlanta CC, so our data. But then we also have the, the 3A2 with the 197E. We had more of that to test. And so you can see good clustering uh, against this B. austria egg isolate with, with uh, quite good antigenic recognition. Clear antigenic distinction from the previous uh, group of virus, the 3A viruses, the Washington 2-like viruses. And the one thing, the other thing I wanted to point out, we don't have any of these 3A1 viruses for us to test in, at the CDC, but they're here. So you can clear, see a clear antigenic distinction between the 3A2 and the 3A1, as well as the base 3A. So you can see that antigenic split into two different groups. The CDC, we don't have those 3A1 viruses, but we did have some of this unique uh, groups with the 155A that I pointed out, uh, like the Kenya virus or in the, or in the Netherlands. And so you can see that's pushing down a little bit away from this cluster, but not hugely uh, different. So to dive into a really a big overall summary from multi-centers, um, the, the, for the human post-vaccination serologic analysis, again, using sera from the most recent vaccine panel provided by Australia, uh, volunteers, adults for flu cell vax and IV4 and elderly. And really what you can see is there's a lot of blue in this whole 3A2 region, even those that have additional substitutions that we selected and where you start to see some of the orange, so potential inferiority uh, against those antigens, you can see that they're the rare antigens like the Kenya virus that I pointed out uh, and, and some of the 3As, 3A1s. And so what this shows is that the current vaccine antigens elicit antibodies that well inhibit the majority of recent representative B. Victoria lineage viruses from the 3A2 subclade. So B. Yamagata, there have been no confirmed detections of circulating Yamagata since March 2020, and therefore there's no B. Yamagata 88, you know, 1688 lineage viruses um, that have been available for analysis by any of the collaborating centers during this period. 
To summarize the Bs, only VICs have been circulating. As I just said, parts of Asia and a few countries in Africa had a higher percent positivity. Um, the HA phylogenetics really illustrates that all of them belong to 1A3, which has this major deletion at 162 to 164 in the K136E substitution. A small number of those continued to circulate and have diversified a little bit further, and they were identified in Kenya and the Netherlands. Um, a subclade, the 1A3A viruses that encode the 150K and the G184E and 187D substitutions, along with the R279K, have predominated and split into two subclades, with the 3A1 subclade seen exclusively in China and diminishing or decreasing in number, and 3A2 seen globally. Really, I've just listed every place there, um, with the majority of them now having D197E either alone or in combination with other changes. Anagenically, the subgroup 3A1 and 3A2 are clearly distinct. You can remember that from the cartography. The post, the, 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 what illustrates that is, is really the post-infection ferret anisera, and it really shows that the vast majority of recent circulating viruses are well inhibited uh, by that anisera, and, but that anisera poorly inhibits the 3A1 viruses. And a small number of the 1A3 that were detected in Kenya and Netherlands are still circulate, and they're not well recognized by CIRA against the B. Washington 2, the older uh, vaccine virus. And they're even recognized more poorly uh, with Antisera against the B. Austria 3A2 like viruses. So they are quite distinct. Uh, to summarize the human serology, the post-vaccination sera, you know, this is again using the Southern Hemisphere panel, which included B. Austria-like viruses. Uh, it really well inhibited the majority of recent representative B. Victoria viruses from the 3A2 subgroup. And yet there were some significant GMT reductions detected in serum panels from the small group of viruses from the 1A3 that had those additional changes uh, characterized by the 155A that I highlighted. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Wentworth. Uh, I invite my uh, uh, colleagues to start uh, using the raise your hand function to ask questions to Dr. Wentworth. And I'll kick us off with a few I had. Uh, the, the first one is the cartography charts prepared by the Cambridge lab. Are they based on ferret sera or human sera? They're based on ferret sera. And that's yeah. because we can get that. Um, I'm going to now I can talk and use yes. my hands. Yes. I'm, a, I'm a hand person. So but we, you can get that separation with human sera. What I, if you, if you remember, I showed you those, we use a 50% mark, which is a really, really high bar. So that's really only two fold reduction. Right. And with ferret antisera, you can get these eight, 16, 32 fold reductions because it's, they're naive ferrets. And they also are, kind of interesting animals in that they really kind of hyper uh, focus antibodies on on parts of the HA and they can they can see basically they can see changes that humans don't see they can see single amino acid changes um, and so it provides very granular data you get these very pretty cartography graphs if we do that with the human sera it kind of everything is just fuzzy and, and merged together because they're only about twofold uh, apart you know, two to four fold apart, unless it's an unusual situation. And then the other thing uh, that I should mention, though, is with the very young pediatric sera, they that does look a little more like ferret sera. We didn't have that from the southern hemisphere, but we have that from the northern when we do the northern hemisphere recommendation. The CDC uh, acquires a sera from the pediatric zero, um, basically six to 36 month old. Individuals. So actually, that gets to the other question I had, which is uh, the H1N1. Uh, there was uh, the co-circulation of the A.1 and the A.2. Uh, using ferret sera, there was a significant difference in the responses between these two. But on the last hand panel of your of your chart, the differences were minor with the human sera. So I just wonder if there are any uh, data on, on, for example, um, pediatric mortality and hospitalization, or sort of a, like a bellwether for the clinical meaningfulness of these differences. Yeah, um, there is data. We publish on the flu view, the pediatric deaths are reportable when they're coded as influenza. 
And we, unfortunately, the H1N1 tends to be a little, have more fatalities in the pediatric population than the H3N2. And so we're, we always are quite cognizant of that with the vaccine viruses selected. Um, they're also the population. So where, to, to answer your question, why did it, why was it fuzzy in the human sera? It's really because the 5A viruses, which preceded the 5A1s, and the 5A1s have a little bit more minor changes comparatively to the 5A2 viruses. And so previously in our population here and in the population in Australia, these 5A viruses circulated and the vaccine was a 5A or a 5 virus. So I'm just going backwards in time. And then um, they also had a 5A1 vaccine. And so the, if individuals have either seen the virus, you know, been infected by the virus or had the vaccine, um, when we vaccinate with the 5A2, there's so many shared epitopes. You know, you saw there's only like, you know, five red dots on that molecule, right? So that's 500 amino acids on that molecule. So there's so many shared regions that you, that we, we sometimes people say back boost, but your B cell memory sees those and responds. And that's what I was showing where you see those GMT titers kind of pretty high to an out of clade group. If we were to take a group that never circulated, that's when you start to see that reduction, you know, you, even in humans. Oh. And, you know, you, you kind of saw that, for example, with the Ghana virus that really hasn't circulated. There's very few of those around now and neither uh, group of people that would have high titers to the 5A1s or the 5A2s reacted that well to that Ghana group, for example. And did I read your slides correctly in that there was back boost with the H1N1, but not with the B? The, f the B Victoria. The B Victoria. Yeah, that's true. So the B yeah. Victorias, because those were all, um, if we had included Washington in there, you would have seen it. But because the 3A1s, the, the China viruses, those, I probably shouldn't have said it that way, but the viruses that circulate predominantly in China, um, those are really antigenically distinct from the progenitor. And so are the three A2s. They both split and went different directions. And so we include those because they're contemporary and it doesn't boost against those. And so that's a, it's actually, you, you nailed it. That's a perfect example of, it's not a back boost because both of those are antigenically distinct and they're antigenically distinct in different ways. Whereas um, in the other example with the H1s, a lot of viruses like those viruses have circulated previously. And that's partly what drove the selection of the 5A2s in the first place as a vaccine, because uh, we have that anticipation that there's going to be a lot of back boost. And there we had some data from human serology that, that illustrate that. So that gives you, you know, when you have two groups that are co-circulating, you kind of, which one am I going to lean towards? The fact that there's not a huge risk in the human population of the 5A1s because a lot of people still have a uh, preceding memory against it, whereas the 5A2s are, are like newer to our immune system. Okay. Uh, we have questions from our colleagues, beginning with Dr. Offit. Um, thank you, David, for that very clear presentation on a very difficult subject. I, I have two questions, if that's okay. The first is, it, it seems that we've largely eliminated or dramatically reduced B. Yamagata, uh, presumably because that strain is less capable of drifting than, say, the other three, H3N2, H1N1, and B. Victoria. Um, if it came to be that we just only had a trivalent vaccine, that we eliminated B. Yamagata, would, would that virus eventually reemerge? I, you know, it's a, I can't answer that question, Paul. It's a great question. Um, I actually, B. Yamagata can 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 evade immunity pretty well. So I, I have a whole theory on why B. Yamagata disappeared. But so, you know, it's one of the issues that we have that we've discussed quite a bit towards the, once we get our decisions made is about B. Yamagata. And we had discussions uh, within the WHO. One of the issues we've had is very low level circulation of all influenza since COVID-19 pandemic. And as everyone is quite aware, there's a very big kind of, I'll use the analogy of an iceberg. There's a very big iceberg of flu out there and we only see the top part of that iceberg. So to, to, to declare Yamagata dead, I would like to have more of a B season. I'd like to understand we have a huge denominator 
And one of the things we're doing in the U.S. with our, our uh, state public health lab partners is strongly encouraging lineage testing. It's an extra test. They don't really have to do it. Some, you know, you can prescribe antivirals just knowing it's influenza A or B. You don't have to know it's Victoria or Yamagata. But we're, you know, through the International Reagent Resource funded by the CDC, we're pushing out lineage tests to all 50 state public health labs, or 64 actually, and they're gonna, we're gonna try to do as much lineage testing as we can. So we have a big denominator where we've tested a lot of viruses, and they were all B Victoria, and none were Yamagata. So okay. For example, one, one last question, if that's okay, Hannah. The, the yes. um, it, it looks like the the with flu cell vaccines as compared to the egg based vaccines that when you grow, as you said, when you grow these viruses mammalian mammalian cells, there's less of a difference between the virus that you started with the vaccine virus and the vaccine virus you end with. And associated with that, it does look like there's a better match in terms of sort of hemagglutination inhibition titers. Is that would would we ever get to a point where flu cell vax would be a preferred vaccine? Yeah, I, 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 you're asking me the hard questions that I can't answer. I don't know about that either. That becomes a regulatory question, I think. And um, and I think, you know, you're seeing I have groups of 20 individuals here in each of the age groups or maybe 40, depending on which serum panels we're looking at. So it's not the kinds of numbers and it's not the number of seasons. So I'll kind of give you that answer that I, you know, I think it's possible. I, if you really look at it, it should work better. It just should. But we haven't really seen VE be hugely different, and there hasn't been a lot of studies in the real world uh, that go to that. And I, I think I'll probably just stop there. Um, and, and But I think the disappearance of B. Yamagata holds hope that if we have a great vaccine, we could actually, um, and we had a worldwide vaccine distribution, we could actually impact uh, flu virus and Thank stop you. it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would qualify that by saying there was a pandemic in the middle. Well, so it's that, it, a huge yeah. confounder. Part, part, of, part of the B Yamagata disappearance was B Victoria. So it almost acted like a vaccine. So B Victoria had two huge uh, waves because of huge antigenic drifts. There was the double deletion mutant that preceded the triple deletion mutant, which preceded the COVID pandemic. So if you remember those peaks, you didn't see any B virus, B Yamagata, even before COVID. And so the, probably the combination of of a natural waves of in this influenza a does this too h2n2 wipes out h1n1 you know when we have new pandemics so it may have been something like that okay dr berger i thank, thanks so much and uh, david great presentation really really clear here and I, I think you've already addressed partly um the question i wanted to ask so i'm going to um, put a little bit more specificity out on it then. Uh, would you, it's, it's the Yamagata strain, and it's mostly just because of the fact that you're not detecting or you're not identifying any samples. Um, you know, I, I do note that the February um, 2022 WHO report does note that there were reports of Yamagata, but they were unconfirmed. Um, and I think we had the same exact scenario come up in the March meeting when we set the, the vaccine for this fall. Uh, you know, I, I guess the question I have is why can't we get access to those samples where they're, they're claiming that it's Yamagata or they're identifying it as Yamagata, but it's untested and unconfirmed? Yeah, the, I think that is a language issue. So <clears throat> the majority of them have been sent to uh, collaborating centers from the either the National Influenza Center or the State Public Health Laboratory where they were initially detected. And when they can't be confirmed, that is either the when when the collaborating center does the the diagnostic real time PCR, it doesn't come up as Yamagata, or um, we can't, and all of them have been not able to be propagated. So they've been such high CTs that they're barely at the limit of detection and they haven't been able to be propagated. And those that have been, there's been a few that are um, likely from kids that were vaccinated previous, you know, in the days preceding swabbing with live attenuated vaccine. And so that will also pick up Yamagata. Thanks. That's, that's actually... And so that's the, you know, sometimes it's confirmed as live attenuated and, and often it's, we can't confirm it by real time PCR or sequencing. Appreciate it. And, and I think this goes back to the original question around the quadrivalent, which is, I think, on all of our minds. Do we continue to include Yamagata or do we, for instance, move to including a 5A1 variant that would be much more potentially helpful and protective since the cross reactivity between the, what the Sydney would have in the 5A2 and the 5A1 would be very limited? You know, I think that's the, that's the question we're all trying to get at at the end of the day.
Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Dr. Perlman. Nice talk, Dave. Uh, so I actually was going to ask the same question that Adam asked at the end. So I have a corollary of that question. So when you do, when you think about these vaccine formulations, do is there a way to do any calculation of the probability of being right or being wrong? Uh, can you figure out? So for the 5A1, 5A2, we have the both circulating. 5A2 is more dominant. Do, does the, does the CDC ever do a kind of uh, calculation to say that this has a 93% chance of being right or 50% because that would help inform this question of right. what you put in a quadrivalent. Yeah. So, well, historically, I think they, <laughs> I think the team, and I, it preceded my time. So maybe I can say this, but historically they haven't been really, when, when we used to only have a trivalent, sometimes it would seem like B Victoria should be in the vaccine, but it would be a B Yamagata year. So, historically it hadn't been great we do do a lot more now uh with fitness forecasting we work very closely with trevor bedford and richard nahar and we also work with um Mar marta luska and uh, michael lassig who both have different types of fitness forecasting systems and they are part of the meetings and so we do do that um, it's not quite the statistical probability that you're talking about because it's it's quite a challenge. So how that fitness forecasting is working is taking into account genetics. It's taking into account something called local branching index, which is how, how many viruses are changing within that particular subclade. And it takes into account uh, hemagglutination inhibition and neutralization tests as, as well as um, positional changes within the HA. The, the issue with flu, it's quite different from SARS where you don't get a complete sweep. Um, and SARS may actually end up going more like flu, where we always seem to have many co-circulating subclades, and it becomes quite a challenge. Unless you have a trajectory that's very obvious, it's it, it, the, typically the forecasts indicate both will continue to circulate. They're confident of that. Um, and then one may be higher than the other. And, and so that's the kind of data that we're generating there. Okay, thank you. Dr. Monto. Hi, Dave. Uh, great uh, presentation. I'm not going to be asking about the bees, which uh, really are unanswerable. Uh, although I think uh, we, it's going to be necessary to bite the bullet fairly soon, especially given the fact that uh, when we did uh, vaccine effectiveness studies, there seemed to be reasonable cross protection, even though uh, there shouldn't have been, but we really couldn't distinguish uh, even in your, uh, even in children that uh, giving the wrong trivalent uh, selected vaccine made uh, a, a whole lot of difference. Uh, I'm uncomfortable when there isn't diversity in, uh, in the AH3N2s. Uh, and my question is, how we had early seasons in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, you uh, came up with the iceberg uh, analogy in terms of getting uh, a number of strains in. Uh, did we have and have late isolates from the Southern Hemisphere been processed yet? Uh, how comfortable are you with not changing uh, the H3N2, which is uh, almost unprecedented? Yeah, um, I think that the comfort level with not changing the H three N two is is pretty good. I, I agree with you. This is our this is the virus that is the most challenging. And to get to Dr. Perlman's question earlier, it's the most unpredictable. Um, even when you think you know what's going on, we did have. Fortunately, there was a lot of data from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the Australia had an early season. South Africa had an early season. Um, and actually, South America had a really atypical season the year before. And so the 3A2s, the good news is there is some genetic diversity there. And you can see some of those amino acids are probably, you know, having an impact, but it's really minor, both in the ferret antisera and in the post-vaccination human sera. So one of the things that we're seeing with this particular antigen is really quite good geometric mean titers. So it's a pretty good antigen, too. And so that also helps that 
you can kind of cover drift better if you have a higher titer, right? Um, it's the, the kind of the idea of boosting. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the antigenicity because that's often something we ignore. Yeah. When we, and, uh, it, when we look at the, the fit. To, to dive into this, and, and in particular for you and some of the other aficionados on the call, the two A1s and the two A2s, I'm just dropping the front part of that name, the two A1B part, but the two A1s maintain a glycosylation site at 158. And that glycosylation site has been critical in antigenic escape uh, from the human immune system. And that's why it evolved in 2014. So it's been there since 2014. And the, the 2A2s lost that site. But underneath it, they had changed a lot of amino acids. Um, and that site basically almost, I don't know how to just say it really, but you can, you can imagine a, an asparagine link glycan at the top of the molecule. It really shields the molecule from antibodies for the most part. And so it made those vaccine antigens just harder to be good antigens. You know, this is getting a little hand wavy, but, but basically that's true. We see higher titers even in the ferrets with the 2A2 viruses because they're now more naked at the top of the head of the molecule. And so there's, there's quite a bit of those circulating. And as, as you saw uh, in kind of the high level trees, they are diversifying, but the, the data we have says that the ferret anisera covers that diversity pretty well. And then the human serology data, remember all the blue in that statistical analysis. And I didn't go in as much detail on the H3s as I usually do in the human serology, but it's pretty good reactivity there. And um, we haven't seen, you know, really what those changes are. You could, you can also do it geographically. Each of those groups, because we've had, I think, limited travel, they're really very geographically oriented. They're like little islands, like founder effect type things where you can see these are South American viruses. These are European, these are North American. Um, and so we had to scrounge around in the U.S. to find some of the examples that would be, you know, in other parts of the world. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Wentworth. I always, I'm not an aficionado or I don't consider myself. So I always learn a lot in, in listening to your uh, presentations. So I had a couple, what, what are probably basic uh, questions for the aficionados, but um, you mentioned way back at the beginning when there were 95% A's and 3.7% B's. With the type A's, you mentioned only one third of them are typed. Would is there a minimum percentage that need to be typed in order to interpret all the results that you've given, or would it have changed if two thirds had been uh, subtyped? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. I understand where you're coming from. It's quite a few viruses, even though it's a small percentage or whatever that are typed. And so, generally, <laughs> if you take a a certain region and, and try to use that as a microcosm, you see a very similar. Uh, ratio. But I, because we didn't do it, I really can't say for sure that it wouldn't be that different. But I think in general, we have how it, how it works is um, determining whether it's influenza A or B is two PCR tests generally for most of uh, these labs that are participatory. And then in order to do the, the subtyping for A, they have to do another set of PCRs or for lineage testing, they have to do another set of PCRs. So it creates additional work. And so typically what they do is just a subset of the viruses that they're analyzing on a regular basis are subtyped. And that's why you, or, or lineage determined, and that's why you get this fall off where a bunch of them aren't. Okay. And then I had a second question and that is, can you comment a little more on neuraminidase inhibitor susceptibility of these different, uh, Subtypes yeah. and all that you've presented to us. So, did you notice I left that out of this presentation? I usually, I usually, did. I usually yeah. include it. It we was in the pre-read. It was in the pre-read, but I didn't <laughs> hear you comment about it. Yeah, I'm sorry because this was a vaccine strain selection. I decided, well, 
it's vaccines and it's not really, uh, you know, therapeutics. But we didn't see, uh, we, there were five that were resistant to neuraminidase inhibitor. And oh my goodness, I'm going to have to remember which subtype it was. It was H1N1. Um, but out of close to 900. So it's, it's quite rare. I, I remember 0.6%. And then we didn't see others in the other uh, viruses of note that were tested. So we're, we're in pretty good shape on the um, medical countermeasure part uh, with, the, with both baloxavir, which is a PA inhibitor, and with the uh, neuraminidase inhibitors such as oseltamivir. That's helpful to us clinicians. Yeah, I can. I, I could. Uh, I could include it. I just, for time's sake, I dropped it out of all. No, I appreciate that. I, it was in the pre-read. I thank you. Any additional questions from the committee members, to Dr. Wentworth? I do not see any more raised hands. Thank you, Dr. Wentworth, for this uh, presentation. Um, and for the members for the engaging discussion. <clears throat> Next on the agenda, we have a 10 minute break. Uh, it is 9.15 central time. Let's reconvene at 9.25 central time. Thank you all. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Hi, Susan, are we reconvening? Can you hear me? Hi, Hannah. Yes, we could um, begin. And um, you may want to make the remarks on the OPH. Because sure. we're technically an OPH session. All right. So welcome back uh, to the members, uh, the audience, uh, and the uh, participants on this uh, 177th meeting of VERPAC. Uh, currently, um, we have on the agenda the open uh, public hearing session. Uh, there were no individuals who signed up for the OPH session, and hence uh, that uh, we will not have uh, any items to go over in this session. Um, that takes us to the... Uh, Committee discussion, recommendations, and voting. Um, <clears throat> so um, we will be uh, discussing first uh, what we heard um, and then voting on the questions and uh, each one of us will briefly explain why they voted. Um, I will, I will start off the discussion by indicating that Dr. Wentworth's presentation was very clear, informative as usual. Uh, the Yamagata situation is very intriguing. Uh, it began before the pandemic, and then we had three years of uh, uh, unusual uh, lack of circulation of influenza, lack of human travel, and uh, closing of schools, all sorts of incubators that allow the flu epidemiology to be what it is usually. So it'd be interesting to follow that story going forward now that a lot of the uh, non-pharmacologic uh, methods of controlling uh, this, the, the COVID pandemics are, are going away. Um, <clears throat> the uh, H1N1, um, the the diversification, uh, certainly by antiferrets, Sira, um, is, is uh, concerning and would uh, potentially um, justify the change in the uh, strain proposed. Uh, of course, uh, as the um, as more data are emerging from southern and northern um, hemisphere, it'd be important to see if how this translates clinically in, in terms of VE and uh, 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 severe, severe disease outcomes. Um, Dr. Portnoy? Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess my, my only comment is that um, I'm not really sure how effective these vaccines have been at preventing disease. Um, I would like to see in the future information that describes the uh, epidemic of the vaccine with the influenza of patients who received the vaccine versus those who did not. Did the people who 
were vaccinated, were they, did they get different strains or were they more or less likely to have infection? We didn't, we've never really seen a comparison between those who were vaccinated and those who were not. And if we don't have individual patient information, at least information about vaccine prevalence in different countries, uh, how many people were vaccinated and what effect that had on the influenza epidemic that occurred that year. Uh, I just haven't seen that information. And I guess I would uh, love to see that in the future because it would help to determine how effective our selection of these strains actually has been on modifying influenza disease. So, Dr. Portnoy, uh, during our spring meetings, uh, uh, we do hear those data uh, pertaining to vaccine effectiveness using uh, a test negative design. Uh, many of, uh, well, most of the presentations are from the CDC and some are from the Department of Defense, um, who has a bigger global footprint. Uh, in that domain. So uh, in essence, this is a shortened meeting, but yes. th those data, you know, we heard them this past spring and we will hear them in the coming spring meeting. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember the details, but I, I look forward to that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments before we proceed to the voting? Please use the raise your hand function. If uh, I'm going to try and see. Okay, okay Susan, I don't see any uh, raised hands from my uh, colleagues. So if you don't mind putting up the questions on the screen, so we proceed with voting. <clears throat> I will read uh, the voting questions. Uh, we will begin with question one. So, Sam, we're going to vote one, then I read two, we vote two, or do you want me to read both, which is more streamlined? Um, actually, Hannah, if uh, you don't mind, I read the instructions oh. first, and before we move on to the voting. These were the voting uh, questions for the discussion. So um, for now, I'll just read the instructions and then we move on. Um, only our uh, 14 regular members uh, will be voting in today's meeting with regards to the voting process. Uh, Dr. Al Sali will read the final voting question for the record. And afterwards, I'll ask all regular voting members to cast their votes by selecting one of the three voting options, which include yes, no, or abstain. Um, you will have one minute to cast your vote. After the question is read, please note that once you've cast your vote, you may change your vote within the one minute time frame. Uh, I'll announce when the voting poll has closed. At that point, all votes will be considered final. Uh, once all the votes have been tallied, we'll broadcast the results and read the individual votes aloud. This is for the public record. Um, does anyone have any questions regarding um, the voting process before we begin? And just so everybody knows, um, the non-voting attendees will be moving to um, a separate waiting room for a minute or two while we are holding the voting session. So please be patient. Do not log off. Uh, we will be back um, once the voting is done and everything is final. So uh, hold uh, Susan, on. if I may, uh, we have two of our co uh, committee members having questions, uh, beginning with Dr. Berger. <laughs> Yes. Hi, Hi. I just had a question about um, question two, because it, it only has the option for the inclusion of the Yamagata strain. And I'm just curious, what if, if the committee were to vote no, would we be then having another question as to what we would be wanting, what we would be recommending for inclusion? That is a question Dr. Ware might want to um, um, address. Yes. Yeah. Uh, typically, typically what we do is that we give the committee the option if, for example, you do not agree with the question that is posed, the committee members can propose something different and then we would formulate a question. Yes, that would be the way it would work. Thanks. Dr. Portnoy? Um, yeah, just a brief question about procedure. Uh, in order to vote, this is a different system. We, do I understand that we use the reactions and either click on the, 
the green arrow or the X arrow, or how will the voting actually take place? I'll defer this question to Derek. Derek, you want to walk us through it a little bit? <clears throat> Absolutely. <clears throat> so we'll be using the polling system that's completely built inside of our Zoom platform. Whenever we do launch the voting question, a poll will pop up on your screen where you will have the option to choose yes, no, or abstain. Once you submit your vote, that's all you have to do. The rest of us will take it from here for displaying results. Thank you. Great. Um, so now, um, if um, Derek, you could put in put um, the voting question number one, so Dr. El Sali could uh, read the vo voting question number one for the record. Thank you. <laughs> voting question one for the composition of egg-based trivalent Southern Hemisphere 2023 formulation of influenza vaccine. Does the committee recommend inclusion of an A Sydney 5 2021 H1N1 pandemic 09 like, inclusion of an A Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus, and C inclusion of an a B Austria 1359417-2021 like virus of the Victoria lineage? We are ready to display. Great, thank you so much, Derek, for this smooth transition. Um, okay, so um, there are 14 total voting members for today's meeting. We have a unanimous vote for yes. Um, here are the voting responses um, of each of the voting member. I'll read them aloud for the public record. If you could display the, um, the Excel for uh, everyone to see, Derek, that would be fantastic. Okay, 
And let's see if I can close this one. Great. So, um, um, all right, here are the voting responses, as you all can see. Um, I will read them aloud for the public record. So one by one. Um, Dr. Andy Shane, yes. Dr. Eric Rubin, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Holly James, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, yes. Dr. Hannah Sahwi, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Hank Bernstein, yes. Dr. Jay Portnoy, yes. Uh, Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Steve Pergam, yes. Dr. Stanley Perlman, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, yes. Thank you so much. At uh, this time, um, I will hand over the meeting um, to Hannah again. Um, if you could um, please go ahead and um, read the second voting question. And Derek, if you could please um, display the second voting question for everyone to see. Voting question two for the quadrivalent 2023 uh, Southern Hemisphere formulations of influenza vaccine. Does the committee recommend the inclusion of a BFUCAT 3073 2013 like virus B Yamagata lineage as the second influenza B strain in the vaccine? Great. We are ready to display. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, there are a total uh, of 14 voting members for today's meeting. A voting second uh, question. I'm going to be uh, reading the votes. We have a total of 10 who voted yes two members who voted no, and two who have abstained. Um, if you could display the total results, that would be fantastic. Derek. Great, thank you so much. Here are the voting responses. I'm gonna read them aloud for the public record. Stephen Pergam, yes. Stanley Perlman, abstain. Dr. Jay Portnoy, yes. Dr. Hank Bernstein, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Archana Chatarji, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, abstain. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Holly James, yes. Dr. Eric Rubin, yes. 
Dr. Hannah El Salih, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, no. Dr. Adam Berger, no. Dr. Andy Shane, yes. Okay, that concludes the voting portion for today's meeting. I'll now hand over back um, the meeting to Dr. El Sali for asking the committee for their vote explanation. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you all. So I'm gonna try and display the screen in a way that allows me to see the members. Okay, so um, we will go over the room to explain the vote. Uh, I will begin with my vote. Um, as I indicated, the, the epidemiology of Yamagata is intriguing. Um, um, I was very, I hesitated between yes and no on that one, but I finally decided on a yes because uh, the last three years were unusual in terms of uh, human behavior, uh, travel, um, uh, schools, uh, uh, social uh, mingling, et cetera. Um, the disappearance of Yamagata um, was um, occurred in this setting, or at least this particular setting confounded what we uh, what we are observing quite a bit. Um, it, the next year would be critical uh, to determine uh, whether the Yamagata is of any uh, usefulness uh, as the fourth strain. Uh, we debate every year the H3N2 situation, and next year may be a critical one in determining what we do with the B and potentially preparing for a, another fourth strain that is of more clinical value. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, thank you. I, I, As far as the... The B, I voted uh, yes, because I agree that the pandemic has been a significant confounder. And I don't think that it would uh, make sense necessarily to shift course um, given the, uh, the pandemic. I uh, do think that we should change the H1N1, the, the first question, because I felt that the uh, ferret anisera and the uh, human serology studies suggested uh, the need to change um, the, the H1N1 component, which is why I voted yes there. Thank you, Dr. Monto. still on mute. Okay, it worked, fine. Uh, I am cognizant of the uh, Hollywood quote from the 1940s, if you want to send a message, uh, call Western Union. But I think we need to send, uh, to begin to think about what will happen if we want to go to uh, remove the B. Amagata, we've had this discussion now for a year or so. We've had some reasonably large B outbreaks from certain countries, from China, from uh, I believe also from France, some other countries where B has really transmitted. Also, the B strain we're being asked to put in the vaccine, the B Yamagata, is a 2013 virus. If the virus is out there lurking somewhere, uh, I'm not sure it's going to resemble uh, a 2013 virus at this point, uh, given the kind of evolution we've seen. I think we really need to start thinking including regulatory thinking about what will happen, uh, what is necessary to uh, include, for example, two H3N2 strains, the ones that worry us most and the ones which we have the lowest vaccine effectiveness. So uh, that explains my abstention. I think uh, we really have to put this on the front burner and uh, it is going to take a while. So we need to start thinking about it now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perman. Yes, I, I agree with most of what's been said. I abstained on the last, uh, on the second vote for the same reasons that others have talked about whether the Yamagata strain should be included and whether we should 
uh, if we're going to do a quadrivalent, have it be an H3N2 or an H1N1 quadrivalent. And so I would, I would just like to con have continued uh, probing of this. Uh, but I didn't say firmly no because of all this uncertainty about the Yamagata strain. Dr. Berger? Sorry, I was trying to get off mute and get my video working. Uh, so I, I definitely agree that the COVID pandemic has been a confounder here for us. Um, however, I, you know, in my view, that the vaccine is really going to only be as good as we can induce immunity to the circulating strains. I, I, I really would have preferred to see a 5A1 in addition to the 5A2 that's, that we approved in the uh, first question, uh, you know, to try and offer the best protection we can to individuals this year. Now, I, I think it is a question we need to make sure that we address in the future. Uh, you know, it's going to come at some point, you know, I think giving us the opportunity to, to address more strains that are, that are circulating or that present greater um, issues, as Dr. Monto just noted with the H3N2, I think that really frees us up to be able to um, try and get a much more effective vaccine going. So that's why I voted no for this round was if, if, if we have no, no detected, um, you know, Yamagata strain going around, we have no, uh, we've not been able to have a confirmed confirmation for two and a half years at this point, you know, the, the protection that that offers is going to be minimal um, in my opinion. So that's the reason why I voted out. Thanks. Dr. Kohn. Thanks. I also agree with uh, everyone else's comments. Um, I voted yes, frankly, um, could have abstained, could have voted no for all the reasons that have been said, but I um, do feel like this was a decision that uh, has been made by WHO and that this is for the Southern Hemisphere. And I think um, it would be uh, challenging at this time to differentiate from, from those recommendations uh, uh, that were made by WHO. And um, I feel like we um, need to push for um, a better understanding and sort of determine what would replace uh, if we decided to replace Yamagato uh, in the in the spring for next fall. Dr. Offit. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think we um, I think we're not going to get much bang for our buck by including the Yamagata uh, in the in the quadrivalent vaccine. And I do think we would get larger bang for our buck if we sort of covered our bets on H3N2. But that said, I think that is a separate discussion. I think we need to have a much longer discussion about what that means for the companies, what that means for, for in terms of their, the way that these vaccines are licensed. Um, and it, because it's really a dramatic change. And, and I, I do think we would be better off with that than we are with this. And, and um, so I guess I, th I think we should in the future really make a, uh, a, a create some time for us to have that kind of serious discussion about moving to, to this different strategy. Thank you. Dr. Weir. Uh, well, let's say uh, Dr. Weir, yes, and of course, I, just... I, would I would rather go at the end, Hannah. Thank you. Okay, good. I was just going in order here, Dr. Rubin. Um, um, Paul just said everything that I would say. Um, I think this vote is everyone agrees, um, and they everyone agrees, and they voted yes, abstain or no, um, with the same um, the, the same feeling. I think we really do have to think about what a vaccine with two H H three and twos would look like. Um, but now is probably not the right time for it. But very soon we should be having that discussion. Um, let's see the members. Dr. Pergam. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have any other additional comments that, other than what has been said. It is interesting that you know we'll be talking about the North American strain soon. So I think having these discussions about what's going to be in um, the vaccine will be important um, as we begin to talk about this. And I guess it would be later in you know the fall or excuse me in the spring. Um, I, I think this will become maybe more relevant at that time um, once we see what happens with this year. Um, I've voted yes because uh, similar to what Amanda said, it feels um, strange to sort of vote against it at the moment. But I think part of the voting from others seems to be more of a, just a comment to say we need to be discussing this. So I think uh, we all agree on that point. 
Okay. Mm, Dr. Shane. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Wentworth for the fabulous presentation. I always learn so much and uh, it's really uh, greatly appreciated. Um, I, I voted yes to both. I agree also with everything that has been said. I am a little bit concerned that um, we may see um, more in Yamagata. Um, and I was also a little bit concerned that there was a large proportion of bees that were not uh, actually strain specified. And so um, that was my other reason for um, voting yes. But obviously, I agree that we need to have some further discussions about composition in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. James. Thank you. Um, generally agree with what has been said. I think uh, I voted yes, given given the, the data that, that are available and the uncertainties that remain in the context of the, the pandemic and uh, fully, fully agree with all the comments about the need for um, additional time for deliberation, perhaps separate deliberation around mixing up the, the composition of, of um, flu vaccine strains and, and how we should view that as a, as a new framework. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Yes, um, my reasoning for my yes votes was very similarly based uh, on the data that were presented and the same concerns that have been raised by a number of the members already. Um, the one additional thing I will say is that um, I think Steve Bergam referred to the meeting we will have uh, in the late winter, early springtime, um, to decide on the northern hemisphere um, strains to be included, I'm not sure that we will have a great deal more data to make those decisions on. And so uh, I think this discussion that Dr. Offit is and uh, several other people have referred to about including another H3 and 2 strain uh, probably does need to be had sooner rather than later if we are indeed to change the composition in this major way. This hasn't been changed for many years now, and it's 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 uh, time to have that conversation sooner rather than later, I would say. Thank you. And Dr. Portnoy? Great. Great, great. thank you. Um, so I agree with what everyone else has said. Uh, the trivalent vaccines seem to be pretty clear and uncontested. I think the data was very strong. As everyone else mentioned, the Amagata strain, it's unclear, but as Paul Offit mentioned, we don't know what the risk is of it um, reemerging if we stop giving the vaccine. At least that was the response to his question. And I would really hate to vote no and then see it reemerge as a result, especially since we just don't have that much information about how it has behaved uh, during the pandemic. I'd like to see a regular year. The fact that the Yamagata is in this year's vaccine means that we're not going to really know what happens if it's not included in the vaccine in February when we have our discussion about it. So we're really not going to have that information. The only way we're going to find out if we really need to keep the Yamagata is to take it out of the vaccine and see what happens. I hate to do that, but that, that, that probably is the only thing that the committee is going to be able to do. I think the fact that there have been a couple of no votes this year when there have never been any before sends a strong message, or at least it should send a strong message to the CDC and to the companies that they need to look into the option of including something other than the Amagata strain uh, for the quadrivalent uh, for next time and at least have that option available as something to consider and to discuss. I guess one question I do have that I'm not sure what the answer is, uh, does the fourth that strain have to be a B vaccine or can it be a, an A strain? Uh, is it possible to have three A strains and one B or does that fourth one have to be a B regulatorily for, from regulatory purposes? I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, thank you. Dr. Gantz. Um, thank you. Um, I um, really do agree with my colleagues, and I think that um, uh, my vote was yes, because I, I think that um, really for reemergence, we've seen different patterns than we've seen previously, and therefore there's plenty of naive people who are coming into this. And only one comment that hasn't been brought up, obviously, is the pediatric population, which I think we have to um, 
continue to consider just because they are obviously, um, as Dr. Wentworth had pointing out more like the ferret and naive to this. So they would follow more of that. And when some of those levels dropped, it was a concern. So I do think that those conversations do have to appear and how we can um, protect um, these vulnerable populations. Um, I do think that making predictions um, and um, I, I I mean, I, I'm hoping that everyone's vote is as loud as everyone else's and that we're all sort of in agreement that the composition needs to be carefully considered every time we do this. And um, we have had the fortune of, you know, not having circulating strains in the last two years. That doesn't mean we can, um, with that amount of accuracy, really tell us what strains. And I would agree with Andy that... Um, I also noted that there were some, uh, at least in the bees, you know, it was a very small proportion of those that were serotyped. And Dr. Wentworth um, responded that that is true. However, um, these have largely been predictive in the past. We just don't know. So that was where my votes um, uh, were, were yes for those. Okay. I think uh, all the committee members had uh, op opportunity to weigh in. So to sum it up, um, the the uh, Yamagata strain uh, inclusion is uh, more questionable. Some of us um, um, hedged on the yes just because we had two to three years of unusual epidemiology that confounded the findings and the small proportion of B that has been uh, circulating, but this year, maybe, uh, will be more of a regular flu season. And if anything, it's also in the northern hem hemisphere, early and strong. Uh, Texas is up and running already, I can tell you that. Uh, so hopefully when we meet in the spring, uh, we can have better data and larger sample size sizes that will allow a, determ a better determination. In terms of inclusion of H3 and 2, Dr. Weir, Dr. Wentworth will weigh in. But to my knowledge, uh, there are no human data uh, on, on, on the uh, quadrivalent with the fourth being an H3 or an H1. But every year after this meeting, I try to probe and I get nowhere. So maybe this year is the year. Uh, Dr. Wentworth. <clears throat> Thanks very much. And I think you you kind of caught on what I was going to comment on. Number one, I want to thank everyone on this committee. I really appreciate your questions and probing questions with regard to the presentations and, and always want to do our best to give you the data there. Um, and I think having Dr. Weir after me is very good because he can tell you some of the regulatory perspectives. I wanted to bring in some of the discussions we had in the WHO uh, meeting as well regarding this. So just from my perspective, in the killed vaccines, there's almost zero downside in including a Yamagata lineage. I understand the reasons for a, a vote or an abstain or a no to kind of get people thinking we could do something else. But I agree with Dr. Asali. We don't have preclinical data in animals with two H3s that I've seen. Um, and you don't know if your immunodominance is going to be messed up. Like, so you don't know that by including two different clades of H3, which I think would be the most likely scenario, um, that you would actually end up with uh, better broadly cross-reactive antibodies. You might end up with antibodies that are more to the conserved portions of, that are the same in both molecules and actually reduce stimulating uh, antibodies to the new epitope. I think that's one of the problems in flu vaccine. We give the vaccine and people have seen the virus before and we get a very small prime to that new epitope. We get a very big memory response to epitopes we've seen before. And, and that prime is very difficult to cause protection from infection. It helps pr protect from disease. But so, so I really think that needs to be thoroughly investigated. And I, people could come and say the CDC should do this. It really, this is becomes an academic question and it's also a company question. They need to have a license for a product like that. And Dr. Weir will cover that. When we talk to the WHO, there's two currently licensed things, well, multiple currently licensed things, but they are trivalent or quadrivalent. 
And so for a quadrivalent vaccine, the licensed thing right now is a B-YAM and a B-VIC. And so really, to me, I think the question is which B-YAM to put in there. And apparently, B. Phuket's a fantastic antigen because it's wiped out B. Yamagata, right? So, I mean, that's, I'm being facetious there, but there really isn't much of a choice uh, regarding that to me. You have a quadrivalent vaccine. We don't have data on another Yamagata to substitute for the 2013. There's been a couple in 2020, but there wasn't really great data that they would be better than Phuket. So, that I'll just put those two things in perspective for you from our perspective our perspective. And I do think we really need a bigger denominator of the number of uh, lineage viruses that have been lineage tested. And we're really trying to get that. Thank you, Dr. Wentworth. Uh, Dr. Weir. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to everyone. This has probably been the most interesting Southern Hemisphere discussion we've ever had. Uh, usually our discussion of the Southern Hemisphere is fairly straightforward and it serves mostly or a lot of, for at least uh, some of us as a preview of the uh, what we'll be discussing a few months later for the Northern Hemisphere. I think this time uh, the committee has really done a great job of honing in on some of the bigger questions that we are going to have to wrestle with. So just to clarify a few things, and, and David did this already, but I'll restate it. Um, yes, companies are licensed to produce trivalence and quadrivalence, but only in the formulations that we already know, 1H1, 1H3 for a trivalent 1B or for a quadrivalent for 2Bs. So any changes to that general composition would require a change to each manufacturer's license. And changes to manufacturer's license require data. So I couldn't agree more with, I think it was Dr. Portnoy that said something about he hoped companies were listening. Uh, I do too. Uh, those companies could be thinking now about what sort of trials they would need to do to show that, as, as David Wentworth pointed out, that there's no interference, that the inclusion of 2H1s or 2H3s doesn't adversely affect the other one. Those are the type of data that probably will be needed before uh, we could make a general composition change of the, of the, of the, of the uh, type of strains that are included. So yes, this is going to be interesting going forward. We don't know what's going to happen to B. Yamagata. Uh, only time will tell, and maybe in the next six months we'll know more. Uh, but these are big, important questions of how one improves the influenza vaccine. And I think uh, it's great that the committee has, has pointed this out. Uh, yeah, I think these are important questions, and we are going to need some more data to make these sort of fundamental questions. And it could be that this is the sort of thing that we, in next March, we end up discussing in top of our usual, which strains should be included. So I'll pause there. If anybody has any last minute questions for me, I'll try to, I'll try to answer or clarify my comments. Over. Thank you, Dr. Weir. Uh I guess uh, one one important uh, consideration now is is it seems that this the the season is uh, gonna be uh, more active this year and uh, more complete uh, typing or representative typing uh, would be quite helpful in, in that domain. In addition to um, companies and uh, research institutions beginning to probe the preclinical and clinical values of, of including a fourth strain that is either an H3N2 or a divergent H1N1. Dr. Monto? I just want to reiterate the fact that we all agree. <laughs> Even though we have voted differently, I voted abstain because of all the issues that Dr. Wentworth and Dr. Weir brought out, uh, but we need to address them. And uh, we really haven't addressed them as yet. I've, and, and a lot of it, I think, is due to our concentration on the COVID pandemic uh, so that the, uh, the, the, the march to a 
better influenza vaccine really has been uh, uh, forgotten for a little while. We need to get back to that. And uh, we need to begin to look at the immunodominance issues that Dr. Wentworth raised. Uh, we uh, have to, as we talk about this, we have to consider also that we have a, a variation in the number and in, in the kinds of flu vaccine we have. Uh, if we go to a two H3N2 uh, component in our regular vaccines, what happens to the high dose vaccine? So it's a, it's a complicated issue and will require a lot of study and discussion. And we need to bring us to, to start it now. Thank you. Dr. Portnoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I just had one final comment. Um, I just got my flu vaccine two weeks ago. And um, I, my understanding is that vaccine hesitancy for influenza vaccine has increased along with COVID vaccine hesitancy, partly because of that. And I'm hoping that the American public, seeing how carefully this committee reviews the strains and the, the data regarding the vaccine, will encourage people to get their flu shots because it really is important if people don't get the flu vaccine, all the work of this committee is for naught. Uh, it's a safe vaccine. It can be highly effective and it's very carefully uh, decided. So uh, I'm hoping that vaccine hesitancy doesn't prevent people from getting their flu shot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I turned the meeting uh, over to Dr. Paydar. Thank you, Hannah. I, I would like um, to ask Dr. Marx for his closing remarks. Dr. Marx. Th thanks. Thanks very much. Just want to say thank you to everyone uh, for uh, uh, their uh, the conversation and uh, the uh, dialogue this morning. I do think it was it was probably the most exciting Southern Hemisphere a meeting that we have had. <laughs> so thank you for that. I think it does actually show. Um, that we are paying attention here. Um, and I think uh, we'll look forward uh, to uh, uh, our Northern Hemisphere uh, uh, discussion in a few months, but just wanna thank everyone for their thoughtful comments and uh, really appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, and, and thanks to uh, members of the public who uh, tuned in. And also very importantly, uh, thank you uh, to Susan and others for, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, the advisory committee uh, group who uh, helped put this together. I uh, really appreciate that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, thank you all for closing comments. I wanted to thank the committee and the CBER staff for working so hard to make this meeting a successful meeting. I now call this meeting officially adjourned at 11, 12 a.m. Eastern time. Have a nice day, everybody. Bye-bye.